Okay, well, welcome. So uh, today, um, Mother Amanda and I are going to have a conversation about the Holy Land and uh, why this land is important and significant to the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So um, I'm switching over here, rather than being the questioner today, I'm going to be the questioner, uh, but this will be more of a, uh, a conversation. We have some slides as well to share with you, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Amanda. All right, I think we're getting a little feedback after. Um, okay, well, so we're here to talk about um, the three religions, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and what they see in the Holy Land, why, why this Holy Land, and specifically Jerusalem, is so important to them and to their faith. Um, so I thought, Justin, maybe one of the things that you could get us started with is sort of a timeline of how these religions developed and kind of how they're related to each other. Sure, sure. Well, the oldest um, is Judaism. Um, it goes back a long time. It's not actually known exactly, um, you know, when people like Abraham lived, but let's, let's just say for... Uh, the sake of argument, we're talking at least 1500 BCE or um, before the birth of Jesus. So you might place something like the Exodus story around 1200 BCE. Uh, so Judaism is a very, very old religion. It's been around for a long time. And if you uh, read through the book of Genesis, you will discover that uh, the Lord God promises the land of Israel to Abraham. The story is that uh, Abram or Abraham is living in probably what is today Iraq, although there's actually some dispute about which particular city of Ur he's from. But anyway, he gets called by the Lord to go to this new place and set out on a journey. Um, and uh, the area that he has promised is essentially this area you see here um, all the way down into the Negev, um, so pretty far south, uh, what is today part of Egypt. And then also the area to the east of the Dead Sea, so that sort of Jordanian area, and then up into Lebanon and even Syria. So a huge, well... Not really that big of an area, actually, but that is the area that um, Abraham has promised um, much more uh, significant in size than the current state of Israel. So the Jewish people, going back to the time of Abraham, have this deep connection with the Holy Land. Um, the story of the Exodus, in, uh, around, as I said, around 1200, is that the... They're called Israelites at this point. The Israelites come out of Egypt and they cross over uh, into what is called at that time uh, Canaan. And there are groups called the Canaanites that live there. Um, and eventually, through a lot of war and fighting and so forth, um, the people of Israel become dominant in that area. And you eventually get the kingship of David and Solomon. And one of the big things that happens um, under Solomon is the building of a temple in Jerusalem. And you can see the city of Jerusalem right there, where we're going to talk a lot about why this city especially is so important. Um, the temple, the first temple, is built on um, the Temple Mount, sort of a high point in Jerusalem is also sometimes referred to as Zion. So when you hear Zion talked about like in the Psalms or in the Bible, that's what it's talking about, that, that holy area. And the temple becomes the presence of the Lord, or Yahweh, on earth. Kind of the, the, dwelling, act, place. the dwelling place, right? Like it's, it becomes then the axis of the world, right? the axis mundi, the, um, the sort of the center of the world, basically, from the point of view of Jews. And this thinking actually will continue uh, into Christianity as well. And we're going to show you, I think, a map at some point that highlights this um, from the Middle Ages. So 
So that's the basic story with uh, with Judaism. Judaism is the has deep, deep connections there. Um, Christianity has um, deep connections, of course, through Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and you can see Nazareth up there. I don't know if Amanda wants to highlight that for you at the very top. And Jesus himself was a Jew, of course. Uh, he lived in uh, the Holy Land. He spoke the local language, which was Aramaic, sort of a Semitic language. And Jesus was executed, crucified in Jerusalem. Uh, to be a little bit more precise, just outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Um, so Jerusalem is a much bigger city today, as happens with old cities. But there's an old city, and it had walls, and people were crucified just outside of the city. And this place is called Golgotha. Um, and given, obviously, the importance of the crucifixion and the resurrection in the story of Christianity and the events of Jesus' life, the Holy Land is deeply significant to Christians, and there is indeed a church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which marks the spot, the general area where Jesus was crucified and risen. I think you might have some photos of that as well. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more depth, but this is just the overview. Um, where does Islam come into this, though? Well, Islam is um, a latecomer uh, to this, relatively speaking. Um, Islam is a religion of the 600s AD. Uh, so by that point, um, Jerusalem has basically become taken over by the Byzantine Empire uh, by the 600s AD. Uh, this is the eastern part of the Roman Empire that was still Christian. Right. Um, people don't necessarily know this, but the Roman Empire really continued all the way into the 1400s AD. You may have learned in school that it disappeared like around 400 or something. It's actually not true. The western part disintegrated, but the eastern part where the focus shifted was all the way around until the Ottoman Empire took it over in the 1400s. So uh, it was around for a long, long time. So they controlled this area. This was kind of just part of the Eastern Roman Empire, as it had been part of the Eastern Roman Empire at the time of Jesus. But the Muslims um, were very successful, the Arabs uh, specifically, very successful um, at spreading to the West very quickly. Um, and they ended up taking all over all of North Africa, which is why North Africa is predominantly Muslim. Um, that used to be a predominantly Christian area, actually, um, and uh, some of the great Christian theologians, like Augustine of Hippo, was from North Africa. Um, and they also came in and eventually took over uh, the Holy Land. And when uh, they took over the Holy Land, um, they began to build mosques uh, in the area, such as the famous Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is on the Temple Mount. But they also um, built what's called the Dome of the Rock. And that's, I think there's an image over there uh, with a beautiful gold dome. Um, Can you now, talk about Abraham a little bit? Islam and Abraham. Oh, yeah, okay, that's a good one. Um, I'll circle back to that in a minute. But the reason that that is important, um, the Dome of the Rock, is that there is a story in Islam that uh, the Prophet Muhammad had a dream. It's not quite clear whether this dream was like a sort of a literal experience or like a vision, but the dream is that he was on his horse and he went to Jerusalem, to the Temple Mount, and he had a kind of revelatory experience um, there. And so Jerusalem became a sacred spot for Muslims, and in particular, where the Dome of the Rock is, which marks that. So um, other than Mecca and Medina, Jerusalem is one of the most important cities to Muslims globally because of this connection to the Prophet Muhammad and his dream and this experience that he's said to have had on the Temple Mount. Now, as uh, Amanda was mentioning, all three religions also trace their lineage back to Abraham. We talked about the Jews, obviously, 
Christians being a outgrowth of Judaism would also trace their lineage back to Abraham. But Islam also sees itself as an Abrahamic religion because um, in their understanding, this is the way the Quran tells it, um, Abraham obviously had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, right? And it's through Isaac that the sort of the Judeo-Christian line develops. But there's a tradition in Islam that through Ishmael, essentially the people that will eventually become Muslims develop, Arabs and so forth. Um, and so they also trace their background to Abraham and they have a story of Abraham going to actually to Mecca, uh, to, that, uh, to the Kaaba, which is that black box in Mecca that people visit during the Hajj or the pilgrimage. Um, and so they too feel this deep connection to Abraham. Um, in their scriptures and in their traditions. So all three religions have some connection as a result to the Holy Land, some religious connection. Now there's a lot of, of course, geopolitical stuff that we could add into this conversation, um, but our focus today is gonna be a little bit more on just the, the religious side of things. But all three do feel a connection, especially to the city of Jerusalem. Um, and if you visit Jerusalem, one of the things you discover is that it's an incredibly um, diverse city with uh, Orthodox Jews walking around, Muslims, secular Jews, Christians uh, of all different flavors, both Middle Eastern Christians and Western Christians and Christians from all over the world. Um, it truly is one big ritualistic Experience. People are, are engaged in various rituals at all times. You might hear the Muslim call to prayer in the background as Christian pilgrims are walking the Via Dolorosa, the, the way of the cross, and it's all kind of happening together. And uh, I remember for, we did the, the way of the cross when I was there, and I had this strange experience where you're, you're doing this very sacred thing, right? The Stations of the Cross. And everyone around you is just kind of going about their business, right? You know, people are in the shops and they're yelling and they're trying to sell things and other people are engaged in other kinds of acts of prayer. And you get a sense of what it must have been like for Jesus going through this, where people were crucified all the time by the Roman Empire. This was not something necessarily that was out of the ordinary. And so for uh, your average person in Jerusalem watching the Stations of the Cross, maybe it's just a usual Friday, you know? Um, unpleasant, but uh, this is the nature of the world that they lived in. Uh, and so well, I had that sort of similar feeling when I was doing it. Um, this is a beautiful view, uh, I think this might be one of Amanda's personal photos, is it? Okay. of the, uh, the city of Jerusalem. And this is the Mount of Olives area, and you can see it has a great, great view of the Temple Mountain. One of the things I don't know that really can come through on a lot of these photos is the topography of the area. If you've been there, you know it's steep, steep, steep inclines and slopes. Um, and so while you can see straight from this point to that point, what's here in the middle is actually a really deep valley. Um, but it's not far. So when we think about Jesus walking from the temple to the Mount of Olives, uh, this is as far as he had to go. So this, um, this temple mount that you see here, this is just the remnants. Um, two very big things happened to the people of Israel related to the temple. The first was that, um, well, let me put it this way. Israel has always been occupied by somebody pretty much uh, throughout its thousands of years history, whether it's the Babylonians or the Assyrians or Alexander the Great and the Greeks, or the Romans, or the Byzantine, or the Ottomans, so okay, I don't know. Um, and when the Babylonians came in, uh, in the 500s BC, 500 years or so before Jesus' birth, they destroyed the temple that Solomon had built. And they took into exile um, many of the elite Jews, this is known as the Babylonian exile, and they were taken into essentially what is today Iraq or, or Babylon at the time. Um, this is 
why, by the way, um, at least until relatively recently, there, were, there was an actual Jewish presence in places like Iraq, um, going all the way back to the Babylonian exile. Um, many Jews and Christians, um, quite sadly, have been um, expelled or killed um, in many of these parts of the Middle East, but there is a long tradition of them being in that area. So the temple gets destroyed. Fast forward, the Romans have already uh, occupied um, Jerusalem and Israel by the time of Jesus. And just before Jesus' birth, around that time, um, King Herod begins a massive building project to build a stunning temple and temple complex. Um, much of that is lost. Oh, this is, a, this is the Herod's temple there. But you can see, uh, this is a recreation, obviously, a reimagining. Um, but you can see uh, a significant uh, building here, and it had supporting walls, and one of the supporting walls still exists, and that's what's called the Western Wall. You can see that in this photo here. Um, and that's where Orthodox Jews gather all day long, right in this space, and there are all sorts of uh, Torah manuscripts and other books, and uh, Separated since they're Orthodox, they separate men and women um, into two groups during prayer, and um, both of the groups are in sort of constant prayer right by the wall. So, if you were to visit the Temple Mount, you would see Orthodox Jews right there at the Temple Mount praying. To get up on the Temple Mount um, is um, a challenge. You have to go through a lot of security to get up there because the Temple Mount itself is a very tense place. You can um, see, these, these, here are some steps, right? This is my friend Elise. Um, but these are the very steep steps on the southern wall yeah. of the temple, and here you can see the Mount of Olives in the background. Yeah. Everything is really pretty close to each other. Um, so here's the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the bottom part, and then there's the Dome of the Rock. Both of those are Muslim areas. So what you will see when you get up here on this on this Temple Mount is um, Muslims gathered around uh, in prayer and in study, and um, obviously this is sort of heavily regulated about who can come in and out by the Israeli army. Right? They're the ones who, who let people in and out, and they're like right in that area. When we were there, they were not letting us into um, the mosque or the Dome of yes. the Rock. Right because political tensions had right. been kind of heightened. Um, and they do let Christians up there, but you have to be um, you know, pretty cautious about what you do or who you interact with. Uh, so you've got Orthodox Jews down here doing their thing. And literally, just up on the top of the Temple Mount, you have Muslims gathered, praying, Palestinians pr uh, praying together. And then you've got Christian pilgrims wandering around all in this area, but there's a lot of tension. Uh, there can be a lot of tension. Uh, this is at the heart of the old city. Okay, so I was telling you about Herod's temple. It was a stunning, beautiful thing. Um, shortly after uh, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, um, the Jews, well, yeah, just a few years after, the Jews went into a revolt uh, against Roman occupation. And the first one started in the year 66, and it lasted until about 70. And the year 70 is another big year in Jewish history, because that's the year that the Emperor Titus finally had enough of the people of this uh, area revolting against him, and he came in and completely obliterated the temple and stole uh, sacred goods. There's a famous uh, Roman, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, relief that actually shows the Romans carrying off a menorah. Um, and uh, so it was completely wiped out. Uh, and that was the end of t the temple in Judaism as we know it. Judaism kind of morphed after that into the Judaism that we know today, which is called Rabbinic Judaism, centered around synagogues and rabbis as opposed to the temple. Can I add one yeah, thing? Um, so if we, if we look at, this is a, a reconstruction, an idea of where Herod's temple would have sat on the Temple Mount. Um, and if you look at it the way we see it today, um, you can see that the Dome of the Rock is essentially in the same place as Herod's temple, which is part of what makes it 
such a, such a hot topic. Um, and the reason that they both are in the same place is because of the rock. Can you tell us a little bit about the rock and why the rock is so important? Right, so the rock is, um, is considered the spot um, where Muhammad had his journey, but it also has a significance related to Abraham. So there's a tradition that on that rock, um, Abraham sacrificed his son, or was, was called by God to do the sacrifice of his son. Now for um, Jews and Christians, that's the story of um, Isaac, right? Um, almost being sacrificed. But for Muslims, it's the story of Ishmael almost being sacrificed. So they have a slightly different version of it. So that spot then becomes super significant given its um, relationship to Abraham and the story of the binding of Isaac. And the, the idea from um, the Islamic perspective too is that when um, Muhammad made this amazing journey um, in the middle of the night on a winged horse, yeah. uh, when he got to the rock, um, he ascended up into heaven. Right? And so there's this beautiful dome over the rock. Oh, that's not a photo. <laughs> um, that has all of this uh, amazing, shoot, sorry guys, amazing um, mosaics and tons and tons of color. And um, it's just really, really beautiful in there. But part of it, I think, too, is, is the fact that uh, Muhammad ascended. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. The, the night journey is the primary reason that that spot is so sacred. Certainly the Abrahamic connection would be important for Muslims, but the fact that Muhammad is said to have had a significant spiritual event in Jerusalem at this spot makes it highly sacred to Muslims, just as it is to Jews. And of course, Jesus had some experience with the temple too, right, as we know, um, where he uh, cleared out the money changers and overturned uh, the tables and so forth. So this, this area, is uh, highly contested because it has deeply spiritual significance for um, the people of these three Abrahamic religions. All right. So um, one of the things that we saw a few minutes ago, let me bring that one back up, um, was a picture of um, the Mount of Olives and the burial site at the Mount of Olives. Why, oops, that's not what I wanted. Why is, why is that so important to the Jews? Yeah, so um, the Mount of Olives, uh, remember when Amanda showed you that scene at the very beginning that had the Dome of the Rock kind of in the middle? Well, of course, the Mount of Olives is the area where Jesus enters in um, on uh, Palm Sunday. But you may have noticed in the picture, yeah, here you go. Um, there are a lot of tombs. These are all tombs. Right? And they go all the way down the hill. So what's that about? Well, there's a tradition in Judaism that um, the resurrection of the dead, which is something, by the way, that um, traditional Judaism and Christianity share is a belief in the resurrection of the dead at the end of history. Uh, traditional Judaism believes that the resurrection of the dead will start on the Mount of Olives. So this is prime burial real estate. <laughs> this is where you want to get. Oscar Schindler is buried. Oh, is he? Okay. This is, this is where it starts, okay? So um, I don't know if there's any plots left, and I don't know how much they cost. They just, <laughs> I don't know how they cram them in, though. Uh, but They're they just... do cram them in, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what the Mount of Olives is. That's pretty cool. Do you have a photo of um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre? I do. Okay. So... As I said, Jesus was crucified just outside of um, the walls of the old city, which today is basically in the in center the of Jerusalem. Um, and by the way, Jerusalem kind of has two parts. There's like West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. And it's really interesting. West Jerusalem looks like a European city. And it's um, a predominantly uh, Jewish and Israeli area. Um, and then East Jerusalem, which is kind of the area we're talking about, um, is much more Palestinian, um, obviously closer to Jordan, um, and is older. So uh, Jesus is crucified right outside the walls. And uh, this, this event happens, you know, in, in a particular place at a particular time, uh, in the 30s, sometime in the early 30s AD. And uh, it is 
a small town, Jerusalem is a small town, people um, would have known about this event, especially as Jesus um, became more well known. Um, and so after the temple was destroyed in Israel, and after a second revolt in the early 100s called the Bar Kokhba revolt, um, which also ended in Roman uh, domination, the Romans said enough, and they expelled the Jews from Jerusalem. This is in like the early 100s. And they renamed the city uh, with a, a Latin Roman name, and they marked the spot of Jesus's um, death and resurrection, the Golgotha area, with a Roman temple as a way to kind of blot out the memory of this guy, Jesus. Anything related to uh, Judaism, they wanted to kind of, in a sense, eradicate. Um, well, in a kind of ironic twist, this helped preserve the memory of the site of Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, so fast forward to the 300s, when the Emperor Constantine legalizes Christianity and his mom, Helen, or Helena, goes over to the Holy Land and decides to find the holy sites and start marking them. She goes on a little uh, a journey and she says, well, where was Jesus killed? And everyone says, oh, where this Roman temple was, or is. Um, this is what has marked the spot, so forth. So the Emperor Constantine decides to tear down that old uh, Roman temple and build a new church there. And this becomes the Constantine uh, Church on the site of the Holy Sepulchre. This church goes through multiple renovations and expansions. Yeah, this is like um, centuries and centuries and centuries. Yeah, so it has multiple versions, but it's on the same spot. It's basically renovations and expansions to the original church. And um, in that way, the general area where Jesus was crucified has been marked historically um, through a series of interesting historical events. Do you want to see the three places inside the church? Let's do it. Let's go in the church. Let's go in the church. <laughs> see, when you walk in, the, first of all, you have to see the door. Here. Oh, yeah, the door. Okay, one cool thing to say about this church, too, is obviously this is a pretty sacred spot for Christians. So people being people, Christians are going to argue over who should have control of it, right? And um, in order to solve this problem, I believe it was the Ottomans, but I can't remember for sure, um, one of the rulers of the area decided to put the whole Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, under the control of a Muslim family. It was one of the um, Islamic leaders. It was, it was one of the Islamic leaders. Suleiman, okay. So Suleiman was the one who conquered um, Israel or Jerusalem from the Crusaders. Um, which we can get into if you want to do that. But um, So a Muslim family for many generations, and this continues today, has the keys to the church. And they open it and lock it up and so that no particular Christian denomination has control of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. One of the funny things about um, this picture, let me, if when we were looking at the outside of the um, exterior of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there's this ladder here underneath this window that has been there since 1787 when uh, Suleiman, Nobody cleaned up. When Suleiman, when Suleiman <laughs> decided that this was going to be, they were going to give the keys of this um, church to these two Jewish families, actually, um, and nothing would be changed. And so because they decided that nothing would be changed as a way to keep the peace oh, between the different Christian sects who all had chapels here, um, one of the markers of the, thing, the things that didn't change is this, temp, this uh, ladder that sits up on a high windowsill. Um, so you go in. You can see it right here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you go in. Well, so you get to the door, yeah. right? So this door looks short because it is short. You can see in the brick that there's an arch here where there used to be a door, right? Um, and over the years, the door has gotten smaller and smaller. And one of the things they told us when we were there is that 
a lot of the reason that this door is so small is to prevent people from riding in on their horses or coming into the church to do something terrible to it. Um, you almost have to get on your knees to get into this church. Um, okay, let's see. So as soon as you walk in, you get to, you see this uh, right in the middle. This is called the Stone of Anointing. And traditionally, this stone is the site of the anointing and preparation of Jesus' body after his death. So you'll see pilgrims come in like this and pray and worship and kiss the stone. They're often rubbing it with fragrant oil. Um, and you can kind of see in the background here, there's a beautiful mosaic of uh, the women preparing the body of Jesus. Um, so that's the first thing you see uh, as when you walk in. And then another one of the really important sites here is um, the crucifixion, the site of the crucifixion. So uh, this has been a, a little over-decorated in my opinion. But, um, <laughs> so the Eastern Orthodox tradition has a strong presence, as you would expect, given its location um, in the Holy Land. And so you'll find that most of the churches are extremely ornate, very ritualistic, um, because they are run by Orthodox. And if you were here uh, for Christmas Eve for Justin's sermons about the peace flame, um, these are the kinds of lamps um, that the young woman took the flame out of to bring across the world and came to us. It's these kind of oil lamps here. And one of the neat things about this is if you look in these glass cases here, you can see the rocks from the site where Jesus was crucified. Stick the wooden cross in between the rocks. Mm -hmm. And here's Jesus. This church is filled with chapels. You can see another one kind of back over here. And, and Western Christians, Eastern Christians, they all kind of have their own chapels. So imagine like lots of Christian worship services happening simultaneously. There's the Latin rite, the Eastern Orthodox rite, Protestants. Um, it's just filled with tons of people. But probably the most popular spot for Christians is um, the tomb of Christ. Yeah. So this is the Holy Sepulchre, and um, you can go, you can go in, but there's usually you see these people a here. huge mass of people. I, I've never seen it this. This this must be like five a.m. or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's usually filled with people. Um, so in a way, this is kind of the Axis Mundi for Christians. This is the center of, of the universe. Like this is the place of Jesus' resurrection. Much worse photo. You can see. Yeah. People going in. So you wait in line and you can actually go in and kneel and pray um, in the tomb of Jesus, which is really powerful. So Jerusalem, especially, is um, the site that the three religions most care about in the Holy Land. Um, and it's why figuring out what to do with Jerusalem is one of the thorniest issues um, in trying to deal with the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Um, in, in some ways, I believe it's been proposed to have it be made like a UN city uh, because it really it, it is sacred and meaningful in a profound way to so many different groups of people. Um, we take some questions. Sure. Yeah, I think it's a good time to switch to questions. Yeah. What questions do you have about uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam's connection to the Holy Land? Yes, Jeff. Yes. The question was, are, is the Dome of the Rock and the Alaska Mosque, are they active? They are definitely active, uh, at least the Alaska Mosque. I don't know if they use the Dome of the Rock for worship services. I know that, I know that people go in and pray at the rock. Okay. You can see the rock there. But yes, the, the, they're both used. Definitely the Alaska Mosque would be used for Friday prayers and uh, regular worship. Yeah, yeah Mary. Um, after the Six Day War, Yes. did Jewish people move into East Jerusalem, or did they stay on the west? Um, the Jewish people, the state of Israel, does control East Jerusalem, so they do manage it. Um, all of the Palestinian areas are controlled by the government of Israel. So what you have is essentially um, marked off sections and spaces and 
the government wants you to stay in your designated space. All right, so what does that mean? So if you are an Israeli citizen, there are actually signs that say, do not go into Gaza, do not go into the There's West Bank. Um, oh yeah, great. So you see Gaza's right there, that's where all the stuff that we're hearing about in the news is happening, just that little small strip. Um, but there are these signs and they're all over and they say do not enter into these areas if you're an Israeli citizen. Um, so when you hear about like Israelis in West Bank areas and settlements, what's happening is, like in that area, is they're in these little um, settlements that are almost like walled villages in the middle and then there's usually some sort of tunnel or highway that connects them from right there into um, some other part of Israel outside of the West Bank. So if you were to live in one of those settlements, you do not have the freedom of movement in your own area. You live in a little kind of colony, basically. Inside of the Inside, and then you, and these, um, the transport between that area and say like Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or something is gonna have um, high walls to prevent you from being shot by snipers as you travel around. Um, but of course, like guard towers and guard towers. laser wire. But it goes the other way, of course, too. So Palestinians are also uh, restricted in where they can move. So if you are a Palestinian living in, say, Hebron or Bethlehem, right? Um, and there are many Palestinian Christians, for instance, in Bethlehem. Um, and look, you're not very far from Jerusalem at all, right? Um, but to get to Jerusalem, um, even for just work or trade or something, is going to be quite an ordeal. You'll have to go through checkpoints, and it's like traveling from one country into another. Um, and again, there are tons of restrictions on Palestinian movement, and you have to have certain passes and permits and so forth. So you essentially have this situation where people, by, by the dictate of the Israeli government, are told this is where you are going to live and stay. Um, now, you can see obviously that Israel, unlike the Palestinian territories, is contiguous and it's easy to move around. So if you're an Israeli, uh, you can go from, I don't know, you know, by the Sea of Galilee where Jesus was, to Tel Aviv and into West Jerusalem easily. That's not, that's not a problem. Um, but that, that is the reality on the ground. The state of Israel controls all of those areas. Yep. What other questions do you have? Yeah, Mary. <laughs> when did the Ottomans come in to take over the area? The Ottomans, um, I don't remember the exact year that they started. There were multiple um, Muslim dynasties, the Umayyads and others who controlled that area before them. Um, and I can't remember exactly when the Ottomans uh, took control of that whole eastern area, but I know they um, they ended up basically controlling it all the way into the 20th century, uh, to the time of the World, World War I. Um, and as I said, they were the ones who expelled the um, uh, the Byzantine Empire, and also eventually took over Constantinople, right? Renaming it Istanbul and so forth. Yep. Yeah, Jeff. Just for a sense of scale, like how far is <clears throat> Jerusalem from like Nazareth up, up in the north? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a little. I don't know if you can see it. There's a little tiny scale map here. Um, so this is forty miles. Sixty miles. Yeah, it, it's, I believe it's the size of Maryland, that's what I've heard, the whole, the whole Israel. Yeah. Um, and I do know that you can very easily hop on a highway, north-south highway, and get up to Galilee, and then if you want to go back down, just you know, it's an hour or so drive uh, back to Jerusalem. So it's very easy to move around. We're talking about a tight space here um, in general. Yeah, great. Just for perspective, if I look this up, the square mileage of Gaza is one third of Appleball County. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And, and would you believe that in that one third, two million people live crammed into that little area? And as I was saying, you can't, you can't leave, right? So um, your, your, their movement is restricted. 
And actually, they, they're being put, my understanding, I mean, this, we're getting more into the contemporary stuff, but my understanding is they're being pushed from the northern part where Gaza City is, you can see there, and down into the southern area. Again, so, two million back, people in a third of the Yeah. So, question what do, you, what do you trace the, uh, Antagonism of the religions. And, you know, what the, I, I'm aware of the Crusades, but was, were there times you look back where there was peaceful coexistence? As, and, and is this inevitable, or do you attribute it to? So, will the three Abrahamic religions always kind of be in tension with each other? Why can't we just get along? Why can't we just get along? Yeah. Maybe just like the times when they did get along. Yeah. yeah. Well, there, one famous example of this um, in the medieval period is in Andalusia. Um, Spain, um, where the three religions coexisted. Um, and there have been periods in the history of the Holy Land where they have coexisted. Um, there was a peaceful transfer of power from, I think, from the Christians to the Muslims at one point. Yes. Um, the, I think it was the Muslims who came, like, came to the city and right. the Christians just said, you know, you can have it. Right. Um, and they walked together, sort of in hand around um, the city, uh, looking at it together, and there was sort of this peaceful moment in the history. Suleiman, who uh, took over um, um, the area during the Crusades, he he did not slaughter um, the Crusaders in the same way that the Christians did when they came in. So when the Christians came into Jerusalem, it was it was a bloodbath. Um, the Crusaders were uh, quite quite violent. Indeed, um, at one point in one of the Crusades, they even went into uh, Constantinople, which is another Christian city at the time, and looted and plundered um, the city of Constantinople. So um, there was mixed motives in the Crusades, we'll put it that way. Um, you know, people went for a variety of different reasons, and as time went on, um, the reasons um, were more and more about plunder and dominance and control. Um, so yes, the Muslims did not respond, uh, when they took over the area, they did not respond in the same way that the Christians did. Um, and in general, actually, uh, the Muslims, similar to the Roman Empire, uh, when they expanded, they followed the same model of letting local elites kind of manage things. Because if you're going to have a huge empire, you can't really run that in a centralized way. Um, so they wouldn't go in and destroy the whole bureaucracy and the whole system there. They would kind of raise up local leaders and oversee them. And yes, certainly the Romans were brutal at times, but, um, but that was what allowed the Roman Empire to succeed and survive for so many hundreds of years. Um, and, and the Muslim dynasties did similar things. I think Charlotte's got a question. Oh, Charlotte, yeah. This is probably a, not a yes or no question, Alice, but why this land? Why would God let this happen? Why would God let this happen? Well, maybe, maybe the lesson is that uh, this land is to be uh, a city of peace, right? So when do you, when do you think about how the Bible talks about Jerusalem. It talks about it as a place where all the world will come together um, and be in peace with each other. Of course, that has not happened. Um, but there's a sort of a vision, a hope, um, that the peace of the world can start there. That people of different backgrounds and different perspectives and um, different life experiences can come and um, gather together as one people at Zion. Well, the prophet Isaiah uses this imagery, maybe familiar to you from Advent, right? Uh, all the nations will stream to Zion. Um, they will beat their swords into plowshares, right? Uh, there will be no more war. Um, the tragedy, I suppose, is that uh, we humans have failed to see what Zion and the city of Jerusalem is supposed to be, which is a model for the world of people coming together in peace uh, around God. And um, I think you can see that in this funny map, right? Oh, yeah. That 
because Jerusalem is the center of the world, right, this is where the peace comes from that radiates out into the rest of the world. This is not quite a accurate map. <laughs> um, but what is it telling you, right? It's telling you that from the point of view of, uh, yeah, this is, this is German. So, okay, this is going to be a Christian map. So point of, from the point of view of a German Christian, I don't know what year this map was created, but Jerusalem is sort of the center of the world. Uh, it's not Europe, actually, right? It's not Germany, but it's Jerusalem. It's not even America. No, no, yeah. We're, we're, we're just, almost not <laughs> Yeah. That's a great question, Charlotte, though. I mean, um, and when you're there, people are always praying for the peace of Jerusalem. No matter what faith they are, and I think right. that's one of the things that really ties us together with our Jewish and our um, Muslim brothers and sisters, is that we're all, we all want the same thing. We all want peace. Um, but our human natures get in the way. And, and real peace has to be with everybody at the table in a sense, right? So one of the things about Jerusalem is that it could be a place of peace because everybody's there. You know, it, it's not peace if only one group is there and, and there's no conflict. Well, of course there's no conflict because there's one group there. Um, but the fact that everybody is there in that area, that this really could be a place where the Abrahamic religions come together and find peace. Maybe one more question? Any final? We got another question. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Go in peace. And love and serve the Lord.